eradicating extreme poverty, encouraging indigenous innovation, carrying out anti-corruption campaigns, building a society based on rule of law. The Communist Party of China seeks national rejuvenation by following a path of Chinese characteristics to full modernization. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn. I've followed China and its ruling party for decades. As the CPC's 20th National Congress approaches, I see the achievements, changes, and challenges. Join me on the party's road to leading China. In downtown Beijing, China's capital, construction in one of the Hutong areas draws residents' complaints. How does the community party secretary settle the conflict? In this densely populated community, a state construction could draw complaints. Hey,帮我。我来喽。对呀。哎。震动特别强。啊。人家我们那房子本来就漏。咚咚咚。到时候我们震的我那个那个。睡不着觉。还有可能掉掉土。那那可不是这一百多年老房了。像有很多的问题
Governing a megacity is no easy task. In 2018, Beijing first introduced a rapid response mechanism, focusing on the leadership of party organizations at grassroots level and assigning hundreds of thousands of party members working in government enterprises and institutions to report any problems to their residential streets and communities. In September 2021, this local regulation on the rapid response mechanism began to be promoted nationwide. I refer to streets and communities as blocks, while government departments the strips. We have a reality that social issues in cities are concentrated in these so-called blocks or communities. The Beijing Municipal Committee bestowed the right of whistleblowing to communities, which can connect with party organizations of government departments, so that both sides can address people's well-being together. In addition, evaluation of the party members and officials in the government also relates with comments from the community's party branches. Party building at the grassroots level is to explore the alignment of forces of the communities and government departments. Since the 19th CPC National Congress in 2017, a key feature of party building is the emphasis on primary level party organizations. The functions of party branches and roles they play are highlighted. The revised party constitution added these two points in particular, inspections of the party organizations and stepping up the building of party branches. The number of party members is pretty large. They are well represented and disciplined, so they play a leading role. The primary level party organization building we talk about today is to give full play to the exemplary role of party members and the key role of primary level party organizations. It is a Chinese characteristic. The Chinese value interpersonal relations, the existence of a large number of party members and party organizations at the primary level serves as a natural advantage. If these party members and primary level party organizations could facilitate party central committee and state policies, it would spur rapid social mobilization and organization. In addition to enabling people to make a living above the poverty line, poverty alleviation also helps people's mindsets keep up with the times. Li Binghua, a young party member in a village in Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region in South China, strives to lead his colleagues toward a better future. In 2017, Fuwan Village set up a tourism company so that, in addition to traditional agricultural income, villagers also began to earn income from tourism. But that did not last long. The COVID-19 pandemic dealt a heavy blow to the tourism industry. And for many villagers, how to increase income became a headache. Li Binghua became a migrant worker upon college graduation. This year, at the age of 26, he came back to his village and was elected by villagers to serve as a cadre. To help villagers, he introduced this ruby red pomelo, an expensive citrus fruit, but villagers had their doubts. To remove their doubts, Li brought villagers to visit the planting gardens nearby and to carry out experiments on his own land. As a result, more villagers followed his footsteps than engaged in the practice. Yeah. 
It is reported that ruby red pomelos, with production of over 1,500 kilograms per move and a wholesale price of nearly 50 yuan for each, could generate revenues of over 1.2 million yuan in just one quarter. Development of rural areas is critical for China. As President Xi Jinping stressed in a Politburo meeting in 2018, the problem of lax and weak governance at rural party branches must be addressed. A central strategy is to recruit more competent young people into the party's rural primary level organizations. Since the 18th CPC National Congress, China has focused more on the development of its rural party organizations and its cadres in the countryside. Party building at the rural level involves many things. One of them is to step up education for party members, since they need to manage the rural economy. Without a well-structured party organization with strong efficacy, how can they jumpstart local economic growth? The party organizations provide the backbone and the leadership for the growth of the whole village through the team building of its cadres and party members. The self-governance, rule of law and rule of virtue of the countryside are all led by party organizations. Village committees organized by party organizations can better enforce autonomy or self-governance and meet all the needs of ordinary villagers. China boasts over 96 million CPC members are close to one-fourteenth of the over 1.4 billion population. The goal of party building is to strengthen the party's leadership. The key is to raise political competence of leading officials who are party members, in particular, their abilities to judge, understand, and implement. A primary hallmark of General Secretary of the CPC Central Committee Xi Jinping's 10 years of leadership, 2012 to 2022, has been enhancing party leadership across all sectors of Chinese society. As the slogan goes, party, government, army, society, education, east, west, south, north, central, the party leads everything. To appreciate how the party actually operates, I describe the striking structural similarities between China's war on poverty and China's war on COVID-19. Consider three parallel factors. CPC leadership, General Secretary Xi's commitment, CPC mobilization. First, the operational leadership of the CPC not just making pronouncements, but actually implementing programs through the CPC organizational structure, central government, and five levels of local government, provincial, municipal, county, township, village. The five levels are run by party secretaries, five levels of party secretaries who took poverty alleviation to be their most important task. And I have been around China long enough to know that they weren't putting on a show for me. They couldn't fake it. Second, Xi's commitment, voicing his personal leadership repeatedly, allocating his personal time overtly, and making poverty alleviation emblematic of his leadership set an example that officials at all levels had to follow. Almost everywhere she went, he visited poor villages and encouraged party cadres to do likewise, interacting with local people. Similarly, with COVID-19, when she visited hospitals, spoke with frontline workers, the whole country got the message. She made the remarkable statement, I have spent more energy on poverty alleviation than on anything else. I know no other national leader who has made such an assertion. Third the mobilization capacity of the CPC, able to command the country's resources and personnel and materials and make rapid allocation decisions for national campaigns and crisis management. For example, during the pandemic, assigning sister support relationships between strong provinces and cities in Hubei province 
a strategy long employed in poverty alleviation between eastern and western provinces and cities. The past 10 years have witnessed extraordinary challenges and extraordinary actions by the CPC in leading China. Here, in my opinion, are what the party has prioritized, writing a new chapter in building a modern socialist country in all respects, economic growth, despite various headwinds, pandemic lockdowns, global slowdowns, and tensions the eradication of extreme poverty and the vision of rural revitalization and common prosperity, safeguarding core interests, including Taiwan, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Tibet, South China Sea, strengthening the military, especially the PLA Navy, increasing diplomatic confidence, countering accusations and deepening relations with developing countries, minimizing COVID-19 pandemic cases and deaths, and the CPC fulfilling its commitment to self-purity by its relentless anti-corruption campaign. Over the past decade, the CPC has regarded its anti-corruption campaign as a dynamic and organic process, praising its relentless and unprecedented fight in achieving remarkable results and in gaining valuable experiences. China has zero tolerance for corruption and strikes hard against it. In the past decade, as of April 2022, the anti-graph watchdog investigated 4.39 million cases and punished 4.7 million people. The process involves a complete set of methods and mechanisms consisting of goal setting, results evaluation, and continuing education. China used to be a planned economy. The nation's production was controlled by the planned system based on collective ownership. Now it is a socialist market economy involving many exchanges of interests. As the nation develops, it breeds corruption. China takes on the toughest self-governance of government with its vast and complicated condition. Power can be terrific and terrible. Power can be used to serve people, and it can also be sought to seek personal gains. Some with power lack a sound worldview, view of life and value, and some lack strong faith. As a governing party for over 70 years, the CPC faces the danger of disengagement from the people. But the biggest one is the challenge posed by our party itself. If you get distanced from the people, and no longer enjoy people's trust and support, the party could hardly govern in the long term. Since the monthly report on violations of the eight-point code began to be released in August 2013 through June 2022, 105 consecutive monthly reports have been released by the Central Commission of Disciplinary Inspection, the CCDI, and the National Supervisory Commission. Typical cases are revealed at critical times or holidays, sending a clear signal that holding perpetrators accountable will be relentless. The anti-graft measures adopted by the CPC are full of wisdom. The core of the eight-point code is to address one phenomenon in Chinese culture, lavish dining and drinking. It is applauded by the people and party members since, in fact, these leading officials are not fans of too much socializing activities. The achievement of full and strict governance over the party and anti-graft campaign is seen with efforts to take out tigers or senior officials, swat flies, the corrupt low-ranking bureaucrats, and hunt down foxes or the fugitives abroad suspected of major economic crimes in the course of carrying out rules and systems. The 19th CPC National Congress doubled down on anti-graft efforts. 
to see the party's political building enhanced, its theory strengthened, its organizations consolidated, its conduct improved, and its discipline enforced, with institution building incorporated into every aspect of party building. All these efforts are meant to combat corruption. The anti-graft campaign can be summarized with one sentence. Misconduct interwoven with political and economic issues led to a startling level of corruption. The fight against corruption is still raging with several daunting tasks in the battle, including guarding against unwarranted influences of all sorts of interest groups, preventing officials from falling prey to erosion behaviors, identifying and dealing with furtive forms of corruption that employ covert methods, eliminating the breeding grounds for corruption, being free of systemic corruption, and diffusing risk and hidden dangers. Since the 19th CPC National Congress in 2017, China's discipline inspection and supervisory organs have changed their working methods, now focusing on preventing minor problems from becoming major problems and strengthening daily supervision. As a result, a total of 74,000 people across the country have voluntarily surrendered to disciplinary and supervisory authorities. The Discipline Inspection and Supervision Departments have criticized, educated, and helped over 11 million people by conducting four forms of oversight over discipline compliance. China's main supervisory organ is CCDI, which has an in-depth study of corruption and is also familiar with Western theories on clean government. In China, we aim to tackle corruption at three levels, make people not dare, not able, and have no desire to be corrupt. In my opinion, the main challenge now is to solve the problem at the third level, leave caters with no desire to be corrupt. And the key to it is to improve public officials' payment. Nowadays, there are many countries in the world, especially developing countries, who are in the process of industrialization and in the period of high incidence of corruption. They share a common issue, the poor treatment of civil servants. We have repeatedly studied Singapore's clean government building and found that good pay could make civil servants very cautious and never be penny-wise and pound-foolish. So, we need to have more courage to reform the party itself to address this problem. Fundamentally speaking, it is to have a sober understanding of the party itself, must constantly strengthen its ability to purify, improve, reform and excel itself. In the meantime, we adopt mechanisms to ensure self-oversight, oversight of party organs, party members, leaders and cadres at all levels. Corruption is the greatest threat to the party's long-term governance. The fight against corruption is a major political struggle that the party cannot and must not lose. People seeing the self-transformation spirit of the CPC will be more keen in supporting the CPC. More people-centered policies and better social conduct solidify the party's governing foundations. Thus, the long-term governance of the CPC and great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation will be more attainable. When I am interviewed about China's anti-corruption campaign, the international media state that President Xi's primary purpose is political struggle, and the Chinese media state that his primary purpose is to remove corrupt officials. I reply that, befitting China's size and complexity, for almost every decision of importance, China's leaders have multiple motivations or reasons. For the anti-corruption campaign, I cite 10. One, officials who are corrupt are brought to justice. There must be respect for law and judicial impartiality. Two, by combating corruption, the party functions more effectively, making rational decisions for the public good, not biased decisions for personal gain. Three, by combating corruption, the party increases public trust. Four, Corruption distorts markets. By reducing corruption, resources are allocated more efficiently. Five, 
Corrupt officials impede economic reform because change threatens their illicit schemes. Six, prosecuting corrupt officials strengthens rule of law. Seven, some corrupt officials, in addition to enriching themselves, have dangerous political ambitions that could destabilize the system. Removing these officials enhances political stability. Eight, Combating corruption elevates morality and ethical behaviors befitting Chinese civilization. Nine, for China to become a world-class business center, China must have world-class business standards and ethics. 10, for China to become a global role model, China must exemplify morality and rectitude. The 20th CPC National Congress will both confirm the two establishments, establishing Xi Jinping as core of the party and establishing Xi Jinping political theory as the foundation of party ideology, and use the two establishments to set the vision, roadmap, and policy guidelines to achieve the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, basically by 2035, and fully modernized by 2049, the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. To appreciate the two establishments, I trace its history. In late 2016, she was declared core of the Party Central Committee and of the whole party. In late 2017, at the 19th CPC National Congress, Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era was incorporated into the party's constitution. And in late 2021, the two establishments were formalized by historical resolution. Since 2017, Xi Jinping thought on has been expanded and applied to the economy, rule of law, ecology, strengthening the military and diplomacy. I look forward to the 20th CPC National Congress with theoretical innovations and practical policies on the road to China 2035 and China 2050.